arcade heroes. So let's say you come across an arcade, like mine, and they happen to have some retro games on hand. Some of those retro games may be set up like they originally were, where they have the old tube monitors inside of them. But then as you continue walking along, you come across one of the classic games that happens to have an LCD in it. Now I've seen two types of reactions with this. One, blasphemy. The other, so today I'm going to get into CRTs or cathode ray tubes versus LCDs, liquid crystal displays, and why arcade operators like myself sometimes end up changing out from the old tube to newer technology. Greetings, welcome to ArcadeHeroes.com and another operator perspective. As mentioned, uh, the debate today is CRT versus LCD. And why is it that some of us operators, or many of us operators, end up throwing out the old tubes and throwing LCDs in them? Um, but before I get to that, let's go over the operation of a CRT. What is it? And then I'll get into the pros and cons, and then the why. And so this is the cathode ray tube monitor for Nintendo's Donkey Kong. And it, uh, the tube itself is designed by Sonyo. I'm not sure if the PCB board, the, the circuit board down there, was designed by Sonyo. Sometimes tubes were manufactured by different companies than the actual circuit board. Uh, but either way, uh, the basic idea of a cathode ray tube has been around for centuries, <laughs> for I don't, don't remember if it was the 1700s or 1800s, but either way, um, in the late 1800s, it was a kind of different design of the cathode ray tube that actually led to the discovery of the electron. And it was about 20, 30 years after that that Philo T. Farnsworth took those experiments and that idea, built on it, and created what became known as the television or the television tube. And so those basic concepts are at play here. And so actually when you're using a CRT, you're dealing with science. So what it is, is first you have your circuit board down here. It'll have different components on it, uh, capacitors. Uh, sometimes in, this, in the arcade business we call them caps, such as this little one right here. Um, you have a coil that implements high voltage into the whole system uh, called a flyback. And so those are very important, and when they fail, then your monitor's definitely not going to work. And sometimes if the capacitors fail, you might not lose the entire monitor image. You might just lose things like uh, certain colors, or you might get weird effects. And so there's things called cap kits, where it's just a bag of capacitors where you just have to remove all the existing capacitors and swap them out. But uh, what happens is, is the uh, electricity gets uh, put into here. This is called a neck board. And you have your electron guns down here, which uh, heat up the, or, or a heater um, of some kind. You can't really see it on camera, but uh, uh, let me see if, yeah, it doesn't really pop up there either. But it, if you look at it with your own eyes, you can actually see a uh, little heat glow when you look at this portion of it. Now, of course, that's one big disadvantage of CRTs is right here is dangerous. <laughs> the, as it says up here, high voltage, like the electricity, go, the voltage going through this right here, if I touched it, it could kill me. And so that's one huge disadvantage to CRTs is just uh, working on them is dangerous. Even if this thing was unplugged, uh, there are certain places, certain capacitors that can hold voltages for a long time that can still kill you. And uh, I've even been shocked once uh, by a capacitor that I didn't realize was discharged. So when you're working on these things, uh, like the flyback has to be properly discharged to ensure safety. But anyways, so the electrons are generated down here and then they pass through this network of magnets, uh, of electrically charged magnets um, and anodes to bend the electron beam, literally. And so the, what happens is, is when your screen is being drawn, 
it, the beam starts at the top left of the screen, draws to the right, and then it goes down to the next line. Those are called scan lines. And of course, you might have seen scan lines uh, as a graphics option on a lot of games that are trying to have a retro look to them. And that's because CRTs naturally had scan lines. Um, but either way, it draws left to right, top to bottom, 60 times a second. And that's why you might have also seen out there 60 hertz. And the U UK and Europe, they used 50 hertz, so slower. But uh, that's your basic operation of a CRT. Now let's get into the pros and cons of CRTs. So the first advantage is that a vast majority of arcade games from 1972 to about 2008 or so use the CRT as the video display. This means that the software was designed to take advantage of a CRT's features. These include things like resolution and dot pitch, contrast ratio, aspect ratio, refresh rates, color, and a lack of what's called input lag. CRTs generally operated at somewhere around 240 lines of resolution. To give you an idea, 4K monitors operate at 2,160 lines, 1080p monitors at 1,080 lines, so there are many more pixels on the screen. The dot pitch I won't get into, although that had to do with the sharpness of an image. There were higher resolution CRTs used in arcades where you might come across what they called medium resolution or high resolution games, and naturally the games were developed to take advantage of a specific resolution, but I'd say most out there that people would be familiar with would generally be about the 240 mark. Now of course this affected how the graphics look. Early on in arcade development, hardware lacked power and getting color on the screen was not an easy task. If you look closely at the pixels on an old CRT, you, you'll notice that they're slightly fuzzy, and this could be used in some instances to produce more colors on the tube than the hardware was actually capable of achieving using a trick called artifacting. I'm not sure how many classic arcade games use this technique, but a lot of 80s console games did to get more color on the screen. This of course became less of an issue in the 90s when game hardware could finally show 16.7 million colors. Refresh rates are also generally advantages that CRTs had, refresh being tied to resolution and overall image quality. I really glossed over this in my explanation, but there are, are actually two refresh rates, the vertical and the horizontal refresh. If you've ever been close to an exposed CRT that's on and you hear this high-pitched squill, that's the sound of the horizontal refresh. So the 60 hertz thing I mentioned earlier is the vertical refresh, while the horizontal refresh had to be many times faster than that. When dealing with RK monitors and converting over to an LCD, one might encounter two numbers that are the horizontal refresh, 15 kilohertz or 31 kilohertz. On occasion though, there were games with weird horizontal refresh rates, particularly midway games of the 90s. So if you've ever heard of the term multi-sync or tri-sync tube monitors, it's referring to a tube that can handle and automatically sync itself to a different horizontal refresh rate. Another great thing about CRTs is the contrast ratio. One thing that LCD tech has been chasing for years is a true black or deep black level that CRTs could easily achieve. More recent tech such as LED LCDs and OLED monitors has finally been getting there, but if you look closely at earlier LCD screens, chances are that the blacks are more of a very dark gray. Aspect ratio is also something that affects the overall look, and this is particularly an issue when it comes to converting arcade machines from CRT to LCD. Most tubes operated at a 4x3 aspect ratio, which is why when you watch old TV it looks more like a box than what you're probably used to these days. Most LCDs, on the other hand, are 16x9 or 16x10, or you can even get 21x9 and so on. I won't get into projectors in that regard, but it's one disadvantage of putting a game made for 4x3 tubes into a 16x9 monitor, although one can also generally adjust the image size to keep the ratio, but even then it can still look a little weird. And there are some distinct and inherent features that the technology enjoyed. One of those was input lag, something that no one ever talked about in the 80s and 90s because it simply didn't exist as a problem. <laughs> This is the amount of time it takes for the reaction of an object or character on the screen to react to the controls. With CRTs, it's basically instantaneous, while LCDs tend to have some inherent lag there, and measured often in frames of input lag. Now, to be fair, there are many new monitors and some other tech that has been developed in more modern monitors that reduces this to near CRT levels, so it's nowhere near as bad as it was 10 to 15 years ago. But 
as of this moment, the only arcade developer that I frequently hear making this an issue and trying to get input lag as close to CRT as possible is XR Arcadia. Another advantage that CRTs had was their ability to detect an infrared signal. While LEDs can too, it's not the same as a CRT, and why this is important has to do with true light gun games. What I mean there are games that used a real IR sensor would fire a beam at the screen, and CRTs were able to sense the exact spot of that beam, which would allow you to blast bad guys on the screen or shoot ducks with your NES zapper. Because of this, one huge disadvantage to LCDs is that you cannot swap a screen out in that instance. A game designed for a CRT has to use that tube, otherwise it simply doesn't work. Unless you use some kind of emulator setup and a light gun made for that purpose, but then op emulation's often imperfect on the graphics side. Now this isn't an issue with games that use potentiometers in guns, and there are a few out there. Silent Scope is one example of that. Uh, most newer light gun games such as Jurassic Park Arcade or The Walking Dead also use potentiometers instead of a true light beam at the screen. And so in that instance, it's no big deal. So those are the advantages. They all sound so great, so why did the industry abandon the CRT in favor of LCDs? The first answer is one of the most obvious, bulk and weight. A 21-inch CRT can easily weigh around 60 pounds. Go bigger than that and the weight goes up with it. One thing that manufacturers discovered in the 70s was that the bigger the monitor, the better a game earned, but it was rare to come across tubes bigger than 23 inches at the time. In the 90s, you did get 27, 29 inch, and even 33 inch tubes, the latter being found in Atari showcase cabinets, but these things were beasts. Um, they were difficult and sometimes dangerous to move as the cabinets had to be even larger to handle the size and weight of the tube. Now, yes, there were deluxe games by Sega and Konami and others that used DLP monitors, um, but those also had a number of disadvantages to their own that uh, made them not so favorable. Where most modern ga arcade games find themselves sporting 47 to 65 inch monitors these days, that would just simply be undoable with a giant tube. A couple of other advantages of LCD over CRT are electrical usage and the fact that when you have to work on a CRT, there's always the risk of electrocution. There's also the burn-in issue, although to be fair, I've seen some LCDs that also suffer burn-in. My Cosmotron's game, which was made in 2019, already has a burn-in on the screen, but of course it can vary depending on the quality of the monitor. Then there's culture and buying trends. At home, no one really liked hauling those kinds of TVs around. I mean, back in 2003, I remember buying a 32-inch HD CRT that operated at 1080i resolution. And IMP, I won't get into either, but it has to do with kind of the image quality, how it's drawn. The image looked great on that one, but I absolutely loathed any time that I had to move that thing around. It was so much nicer to finally get an LCD panel, and most consumers felt the same way. As demands for tubes dropped hard, it began to make better economic sense to use LCDs in new arcade games, just because nobody was really making tubes anymore, save very few exceptions. At this moment, I've received some emails from a manufacturer in China that I've never heard of offering brand new 19-inch CRTs for arcade machines, but I don't know anyone who's taken the risk on these to vouch for their quality. Um, but overall, the lack of supply is also a big reason the industry moved in that direction. But what about instances where a game had a CRT and an operator like myself swaps it out for an LCD? Why are we doing this, especially where these conversions often don't look that great? and the pixels can be stretched while looking sharper than the originals and just overall can look unprofessional depending on how it's done. So the answer there has to do with costs and parts. Now, I can't speak for other operators out there, just for myself, but if I get a game with a CRT in it, I do everything that I possibly can to keep it going for as long as is possible. But with the march of time, that's becoming more and more of a challenge to do. When I do a conversion, it's only because I've uh, exhausted other avenues first. However, even I know when to draw the line. When you're running a business, you don't stay open by losing money. If swapping out a tube with a new flat panel is going to save you that money, then that's what ops are going to do. Where I've converted a few games over the years, I've found that there's no difference in what they earn either. Just 
this it seems to negate that anyone is really offended by it. I also imagine that people are so used to playing classic games on an LCD at this point that they really just don't think much of it, unless they're a preservationist. But I found that most collectors never come by anyways, so that's where it's not really a problem. Back to the point though, in my case I am the technician, while most arcades will hire their own. And because tubes are now uncommon, a lot of repair companies refuse to work on them anymore. When you can find someone that fixes it, the cost to do so might cost a few times more than just running down to a Walmart or a Best Buy, getting an LCD, and then ordering a signal converter board off of eBay. And the same issue can apply to monitors with odd or rare parts in them. That's why I ended up selling off my Asteroids Deluxe as a hard to find part cost over a hundred bucks which is more than what the game made on an annual basis. In my case where I do what I can to fix it I have to constantly be on the prowl for parts and if it's a odd brand then that becomes almost impossible to do. Now there are places that still sell parts such as ArcadePartsAndRepair.com but you won't always find the parts you're looking for, especially if the monitor came from Japan. I had a Ast uh, Sega Astro City 2 sitting here collecting dust for several years because I could just never find the parts to fix it. More recently, I had to give up on a tube monitor for Virtua Fighter 2 after I first replaced the brightness potentiometer because it was having this weird issue of flickering between bright and dark. Um, I installed a new cap kit, I installed a new flyback, and the problem just it would go away for a short time and then it would come back again. So overall when a CRT fails, the reasons why can be varied. I mean, if you're really lucky, it might be a blown fuse, but I almost never come across that. It's usually something else, a bad transistor somewhere, bad capacitors, or a bad flyback. The worst case scenario is when something within the neck of the tube goes bad. And this is an issue at present with my Street Fighter 2 where the green went out on the tube itself and the neck board is partially damaged so I can't just put that neck board and circuit board on a different tu compatible tube. Um, it's pretty much just it works but it doesn't work perfectly and so when it finally goes out I'm just gonna have to LCD it or if I can find another tube to go in there that would fit then that would work too. Um, that was also the case with both my Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles by Konami and Mortal Kombat 3, where a replacement cap kit made no difference, neither did replacing a transistor on the neck board that dealt with color. Um, they just were all lacking green and red, so it was a very blue image, but it was all within the neck. Now, I've heard of CRT repair experts that can replace that whole neck component, but that's beyond the scope of most arcade operators, such as myself. I would never even dare to attempt that sort of thing. But if you can find somebody that's able to do that replacement and can even find the part, then most likely the cost is going to vastly outpace the cost of, again, running down the Walmart or Best Buy and getting that LCD board. And that also gets to the number of companies out there willing to fix tubes or their circuit boards. It's pretty small at this point. Just doing a quick and lazy search, I've only found about five or six places saying that they're willing to do so. And on top of that, you may have a brand of monitor that a technician refuses to work on. Uh, bring up Neotech and some technicians will hang up the phone on you or never respond to your email. Uh, that was the case with a Mars Matrix by Capcom that I had. The monitor on that went out. It was a Neotech and it was also a hard to find Neotech um, circuit board, a rare one I guess, and I, could, I never could find anybody that was willing to work on it and I didn't have the expertise to work on it at the time either. So I just gave up and put an LCD in it. I think that was the first game that I converted over to LCD. Now, are there some good compromises out there? Yeah. Apart from the one company still making tubes, there's an Australian company by the name of Arcuda who recently announced the production of 19-inch 4x3 LCDs, and they said that they're also going to be manufacturing other sizes, too. Of course, there have been major delays here thanks to the pandemic-related production issues, but they have listed them for sale. They've been designed as a drop-in replacement for classic arcade games. The only reason I haven't grabbed one for my like Street Fighter 2 or Virtua Fighter 2 yet is the cost on the monitor itself and shipping. So it is a bit more than that uh, Walmart or Best Buy LCD. 
Um, I may just have to bite the bullet on those eventually since shipping costs won't come down anytime soon, but I think overall it's a good compromise. It's the only other compromise that I've been aware of over the years, but it never went anywhere, was a interesting technology that Toshiba was working on where it was trying to take the kind of the technology of a CRT and turn it into a flat panel and so instead of having this neck in the back to draw the image every pixel would have its own electron gun or cluster of electron guns like a red green and blue electron gun or something like that it was called SED technology but this was like 2008-2009 and of course as LCDs um, improved vastly improved in quality I think Last I heard, they just dropped the idea on that. But uh, for, uh, who knows? Maybe one day somebody could pick up the technology and see if it'd be worth it. That would probably be the, the best way to bring CRT quality back to the arcade, particularly classic arcades, um, but also to resolve that issue of what to do about light gun games. Like, I believe I mentioned my Carnival. Um, it's been sitting here for years, dead, uh, mainly because of a monitor issue. I think there's something else wrong with it, too, because I did fix the monitor and was still having problems. Um, but still, just, you know, eventually your your time crises and your older House of the Deads and carnival and whatnot, uh, there will be a point where there's no viable option for those to continue on anymore. And so uh, hopefully something like an SCD TV could come along and work as a drop-in replacement and also cut down on the weight. Um, it's that or if somebody manufactures CRTs in those size again. But let me know your thoughts on this and um, if you agree or disagree. I'm, I know there will be collectors and purists out there that will absolutely disagree no matter what. Um, but again, it just comes down to when you're operating a business and you want to have these sorts of games available for people to enjoy, then you know, it's either you have some way of presenting the video screen or none when the CRT fails. And like I said, personally, I do everything I can to keep the CRTs and these going, but it does sometimes reach a point where it just can't go anymore. And I've come across some CRT boards, or I've pulled some out before, where like there's scorch marks or the PCB itself is cracked and, and all that, and uh, where I'm not necessarily, I'm not professionally trained in repair of these things and it's getting so hard to find people that are that um, yeah, it's just easier to put an LCD in there. But again, let me know what you think and stay tuned for more videos on arcade operations. I'll have the one about game design coming soon as well and I'm going to have something interesting about a unreleased arcade game from Atari that uh, those into arcade history or video game history might be interested in. But uh, either way, thanks for watching. See you around.